story of freight. It is the story of how one great railroad handles millions of tons of the thousands of things which we need and desire for our way of life. The chair you are sitting on, the clothes you are wearing, yes, even what you had for breakfast this morning, all at one time were articles of freight. The real story of railroad freight, however, cannot be learned by watching the trains go by. For that, we must go to the yards and terminals where freight to and from some 90,000 American communities is handled, switched, and classified. It is from such places that freight is sent on its way, often for thousands of miles and over the tracks of many railroads, to reach its destination with the sureness of a homing pigeon. To tell our story, we're going to visit many of the Chicago and Northwestern's important yards and terminals in Chicago, the world's greatest railroad center. But first, let us look at a map of the Northwestern system and its connecting lines. Notice the tremendous area between Chicago and the West Coast. These lines represent some 10,000 miles of Northwestern track and many thousand miles more of connecting lines. As we move closer to Chicago, we see a heavy network in the richest part of the Middle West. Much of the freight to and from this area passes through Chicago. Looking down on a map of Chicago, we see many important freight handling facilities. Right near the lake is the North Pier Terminal, home of many industries and warehouses. Here is the Well Street Station, deep in downtown Chicago. Off to the south is the city's famous Union Stockyards. Here is the Wood Street Terminal, also known as the Potato Yard. And to the right is the Morgan Street Yard, where fresh fruits and vegetables are handled. That big spot, clear to the left, is Proviso Yard, the greatest yard of them all. So large is Proviso that only a bird's eye view will give us an idea of its scope. So here we are, looking down on Proviso from the north. Even in this one small section of 30 tracks, totaling 28 miles, there is ample room for the longest freight trains. It is to this part of the terminal that cars are brought to go through the electric retarder yard, or as the railroad men say, over the hump. As we glide toward the main part of the yard, we come in sight of the huge freight transfer house, where less than carload freight is handled. To the left of the freight house is the electric retarder yard, which is one of Proviso's points of interest. By means of gravity and remote control, cars are made to roll down a grade and switch to any one of 60 tracks. We shall soon witness in more detail how this fascinating operation is done. How would you like to lose yourself in this forest of freight cars? This vast terminal covers more than 1,200 acres and has almost 200 miles of track. About 128 freight trains leave and arrive here every day. It looks quiet from high above, but down on the ground, this yard is a scene of great activity in which more than 2,200 employees take part in every phase of switching, loading, and unloading. Proviso even has its own repair yard where whole cars can be rebuilt. In this yard, a young army of trainmen, freight clerks, and others, expert in specialized services, keep the freight rolling. The transfer house in which freight in less than carload lots is handled is so huge that 700 cars can fit under its roof. And how long a train is that? Well, almost seven miles. Let's go down on the ground and watch a train arrive from Minneapolis. Its long line of cars must be separated and sent on to many different points. To do this, the cars in this particular train must first go through the hump yard. Yard employees, just like those out on the line, must be experts in their work. This engineer, with a background of more than 40 years of railroading, carefully goes over his locomotive before climbing up into the engine cab. Unlike those on the main line, however, this pump engine, a powerful ten-wheeler designed for special work, pushes rather than pulls the cars. Its small drive wheels do not give it speed, but they do exert a tremendous force in moving as many as 200 cars ahead of them. Steadily, at an even pace of four miles an hour, the cars roll on toward the crest of the hump, where they will end one phase of their journey.
As the cars move ahead, they pass an inspector who carefully looks over each one. If he discovers something wrong with the car, he tags it with a bad order slip, which means it must be placed in perfect condition before it can leave the yard. Meanwhile, another employee cards the cars. In other words, tags them according to destination so that they will be properly switched as they go over the hump. At the top of the hump, a man called a pin puller unlocks the couplings, permitting the cars to roll free down the grade away from the train. Hour after hour, this process goes on with the cars doing what looks like a handshake in reverse. But actually, these operations involve not only coordination, but careful planning and cooperation of railroad men. Even the way the pin puller does his job determines, for example, how the cars will be switched by remote control in the towers in the background. Let's look inside one of these towers where the operator, guided by a teletyped message listing cars, their contents and destinations, not only switches the cars, but determines their speed, all by remote control. Near the top of the slope, the lead tower man takes over initial control, switches cars to the left or right. Two other tower operators down the hill a short distance take over the job when the cars reach their territory. Between them, they switch cars to 60 tracks, as indicated in part by this track diagram. This is the tower man's view of the scene in the electric retarder yard. Let's watch some of these cars come down the grade. A slight touch of a retarder lever sets the heavy steel car retarders in action, squeezing and slowing down the rolling car wheels. So efficient is this retarder action that a loaded car can be made to slow down, yes, and even stop, while halfway down the grade. It is such controls that assure safe handling of car contents, so that when it reaches the bottom of the slope, there will be no jarring contact with other cars. Up in the humpmaster's office, the pin puller is supervised by a checker, who also keeps in constant touch with the control towers by means of a public address system. Everyone concerned knows at all times just what's going on. Let's watch some of the cars going downhill, always remembering that their speed and direction are controlled by the tower men. Cars going deep in the yard are allowed to roll on almost unchecked, while heavily loaded cars, with only a short distance to go, are carefully slowed just the right amount. Notice how unseen hands switch them to the right or left. Sometimes a car with very fragile contents goes through. In that case, a rider goes along to handle the brakes, just as double security. Day and night, in a 24-hour operation, freight of all kinds and from all railroads goes over the hump. Here's a heavy load of car wheels, which will soon be rolling on their own. Then a tank car of gasoline. For all we know, this gas may eventually be used in the new automobiles coming along directly behind. Sometimes it's logs going to sawmills. Then along will come a car of steel girders. Name the commodity, and it's probably rolling over the hill right now. But that's only one proviso operation. This huge freight transfer house holds another story of how less than carload freight is handled. By less than carload, we don't mean half-empty cars. We mean freight in one car from more than one shipper or destined to more than one receiver. Here is such a train made up of cars from all parts of the United States, which have just been sorted from hundreds of others that have gone over the hump. Each of the 24 tracks in the building is long enough to accommodate a sizable train of at least 36 cars. 
like the one a yard engine is now backing into the house. To do business in a 21-acre building, you need special equipment like these tractors and trailers starting off in the morning for a busy day. There are 72 such tractors, and believe it or not, 4,600 trailers. These trailers, sometimes in trains of considerable length, follow their tractors as if on unseen rails. A special connection between the trailers, plus of course the skill of the drivers, is the answer to how they are made to follow an exact path. They must do this because inside of the building are miles of platforms over which hums the traffic of freight in all directions. On each side of the platforms are cars to be loaded and unloaded. And when the house is full, there are almost 700 cars. Men work fast for they are paid on a tonnage basis. As they load their trailers, a checker verifies the commodities handled and gives them their papers before they depart. Those papers stay with the freight when it goes into another car or into a waiting motor truck. As each piece of freight is handled, it is also inspected carefully for possible damage. Papers too are double checked to make certain that the routing is correct. Here, each article receives the attention that whole cars receive out on the line. Out on the platforms, the scene is like Santa Claus' workshop just before Christmas. The trucks with their long trains wind in and out over the 18 platforms. There are no traffic jams despite the appearance of disorder. The men have their traffic rules and you'll find them far more courteous to each other than many drivers out on the highways. You'll see soap and hairpins, nylon hose and hardware, cases of food, and here are some sleds for next winter going for a brief ride down these aisles. Trailers are carefully loaded so that packages will not topple off on curves, and the tractor drivers go at reasonable speeds to prevent damage to the contents of their trains. Occasionally, packages are broken. This is usually due to the use of containers not strong enough to hold heavy shipments, as is obvious in this instance. Notice that the employee counts and checks the contents and then carefully repacks in a sturdy wooden box. As a special service designed by Northwestern to help speed the freight, damaged containers are repaired or replaced when necessary without additional cost to the shipper, regardless of who was at fault. Even a steel drum discovered to be leaking is ingeniously sealed with this special tool. It takes time to repair damaged shipments such as these. It is obvious that each of these commodities was improperly packaged or the containers would not have broken open. Another cause for delay on some shipments is incorrect or incomplete addresses. Here again, employees check and trace origins and destinations so that the packages may be speeded on their way as quickly as possible. Outside the building are concrete driveways for long lines of trucks to pick up and unload freight to and from the city of Chicago and for interchange with other railroads. These trucks are loaded and unloaded directly from platforms inside the house. In all operations, every package of freight is followed closely. Not only do the proper papers stay with their packages, but the packages themselves are marked so that overcoats don't go to Miami instead of Duluth. Cars are loaded, of course, also in this great building. Care is taken in this operation to make certain the load will not shift while in transit, or that a heavy package is not placed on top of a light carton. Anything that might roll or shift is securely blocked and fastened so that it may travel safely. Once the cars on one platform are loaded, a switch engine calls for them, takes them out into the open to be cut into a train en route to their destination. A new train of empty cars, which have been carefully cleaned out and inspected, is then backed in. Because the loading platforms are more than a quarter mile long, in strategic spots of the house are special crossovers. Without them, tractors and trailers would have to travel long distances to take freight from one part of the house to another. 
The crossovers are raised when a train of freight cars comes in and then lowered back into place. These serve as efficient shortcuts, where every shortcut means much in shipping time. But Proviso is not only a vast yard of moving cars and lifting and transporting freight. Right next to the freight house is the office building in which much of the paperwork is done. Here are the headquarters of the station agent and all his assistants and employees, a working force of 150. Every carload of freight passing through the yard and every package handled in the freight house is kept on record in this building. Rate clerks are busy with their highly specialized tasks. It is natural that filing is extensive in such an office because the proper papers must be instantly available when needed. Waybill pouches are made up for each outbound freight car, some of them representing hundreds of packages. Messages and bills can be sent quickly from the office to many points in the yard in pneumatic tubes. A teletype system offers rapid communication, not only in the yard, but also between the office and the general offices in downtown Chicago, the Wood Street Terminal, and the Pacific Fruit Express offices. Just outside the freight house is a 10-ton electric crane for handling heavy shipments. Notice how its electromagnet picks up steel girders and deposits them gently and neatly on the waiting trailers. This crane is used extensively for heavy and bulky shipments of iron, steel, metal tanks, machinery, and the like. Another of the many conveniences to be found in the yard is an ice manufacturing plant. Refrigerator cars destined for further travel are switched right to the loading platforms. The bunkers at either end of the cars are re-iced with a minimum of time and trouble, and the cars are ready to continue to their destination. Proviso Yard has a great advantage in its location, just outside Chicago, away from congestion and traffic. But in the city itself, the Northwestern operates other and smaller yards and terminals. The Merchandise Mart in downtown Chicago is the world's largest commercial building. For almost 100 years, the Northwestern has had tracks over this ground where once stood its passenger station. In fact, the railroad still owns this property, having sold, in a unique transaction, nothing but the space on which the building pillars stand and the air rights to the owners of the Merchandise Mart. Underneath this huge structure is located one of the largest freight terminals in the city, with freight platforms like those at the Proviso Freight House. Day and night, switch engines are kept busy moving cars in and out to the ground level of this tremendous building. The tracks do not end in the building, but continue right through and on toward the lake. This permits freight to be brought to the very doors of some of Chicago's most famous office buildings on Michigan Avenue. Eastward and under the broad boulevard, the tracks run past the shadows of beautiful skyscrapers, huge warehouses, and a variety of food products plants located in the North Pier Terminal area, a section of the city where the pulse of commerce beats steadily. Here, the freight handled may include anything from great rolls of newsprint, candy, imported olives, or cheese. The steel rails go on into Chicago's giant Navy Pier, where thousands of sailors received training in the last war, and where freight rumbled through the guarded gates. The Wood Street Terminal is another of Chicago's interesting freight handling facilities. It is the world's largest potato yard, and that's an appropriate name, for more than half a million tons of spuds pass through Wood Street annually. They come from every state in the Union to be purchased or sold by brokers and dealers, either for Chicago markets or reconsignment to other cities. Every morning, dealers gather here to buy and sell as much as 70,000 bushels of potatoes. On the wall each day are listed the numbers of cars of potatoes that have arrived and are in the yard and the states where they originated. Another board lists every car by number and its location in the yard, which, with its auxiliary tracks, has room for more than 2,500 cars. Brokers can tell quickly, by means of the listing, just where every car is located.
After determining the location of the cars in which they are interested, the dealers leave the office building and drive or walk over the broad concrete roads, which permit easy access to any point in the terminal. Yard employees have already opened the doors of all newly arrived cars, so as to permit easy inspection of the contents. From car to car, the dealers go, checking the quality and grading of the potatoes. They spend as much time discussing the good or bad points of the potato as art connoisseurs might over some world-famous painting. But after all, the potato is one of the most important items in the daily diet of the nation. Here is a car of fine Idaho's in the 10-pound special pack, which makes it easy to judge condition and quality. They're really beauties, aren't they? The national reputation of the dealers and brokers who operate in this yard has been built up and maintained by the very thoroughness with which they do their work. Soon these very potatoes will be delighting housewives in Chicago or Baltimore or whatever city to which they may be consigned. Other vegetables with good keeping qualities such as cabbages, onions and so forth also arrive in this yard. This dealer literally leaves no cabbage unturned in his inspection of the sack he had selected at random from the car. The open sacks left by the dealers are all securely coopered by a corps of railroad employees who see that everything is left in good order before the cars are closed for later shipment or unloading. These men who seem to be wandering casually around, not far from one of the rows of telephone booths which are located here and there around the yard, are among the largest potato operators in the country. They are in the midst of actual trading operations. What appears to be a chance meeting with a few words and some scribbled notes may be the buying or selling of from one to 20 or more carloads of potatoes. Besides supplying Chicago, the Midwestern Territory, many cars are shipped east and south, often as a result of long distance calls received right here. Trucks are able to back up on the concrete drives to the very doors of cars for quick and easy unloading. Once trucks are loaded and checked, they must pass over scales before leaving the yard. Thus the railroad has a record of every load that leaves Wood Street before it is converted into crisp French fries, baked or mashed potatoes for your table. A short distance from Wood Street is Southwater Market, Chicago's greatest fruit and vegetable center. Northwestern tracks lead to the Morgan Street Yard, a terminal specializing only in perishables, which is just in the rear of the market. This convenient location permits easy transfer of fruits and vegetables. Every day, cars arrive from all over America with lettuce, peaches, tomatoes, and many other perishable foods, depending on the season. Each year, well over 100,000 carloads of perishable foods worth more than $150 million arrive in Chicago. Here, for example, is a car of celery protected under a heavy blanket of snow ice during its trip from California. What happens when the snow ice melts? Well, here comes a servicing crew to make more snow. Yes, we said make more snow. Ice cakes are ground up fine in special machinery in the truck and forced out of the hose at the rate of 500 pounds a minute. It only takes a few minutes, and the fruits or vegetables are protected not only from heat, but also cold, because the snow blanket doesn't let the temperature change very much, regardless of the outside weather conditions through which the car may pass. In the same general vicinity of Morgan and Wood Street terminals is the Chicago Fruit Auction Sales House, where hundreds of carloads of crated oranges, pineapples, and other fruits are sold to wholesalers. Here comes fruit from all over the nation on one of its last laps before it goes into the homes of Mr. and Mrs. America. The second floor of the building is devoted to the actual auction, where a fast-talking auctioneer seeks the highest bid from keen and alert produce men. To the amazement of the casual visitor, the auctioneer, who has a jargon understood only by the initiated, always has the situation under complete control. But here's another terminal, the Northwestern Stockyard at West Chicago, often called the Livestock Hotel. More than a million head of cattle and sheep pause here each year 
before going on to the packing houses of Chicago and other cities. Here they are fed and rested, yes, and even fattened. These sheep, incidentally, came from many far western states, but they certainly don't look homesick. This particular flock has been here only a few days, but rest and good food has made it ready for the market. It's only a short train ride from West Chicago to the great Union stockyards of the city. This is the end of the line for millions of head of livestock that have been fattening on corn in Iowa or roaming the range of western prairie and mountain country. Once they enter these pens, the cattle, sheep and hogs are only a short time from becoming thick, juicy sirloins, lamb and pork chops, and the many other meat cuts that have made the American dinner table the envy of the world. Stock cars are pulled directly to the platforms and chutes where cattle and other livestock are unloaded quickly and efficiently. Simple as the job may seem, it requires skill of a kind for which the American railroads and their employees are famous. The railroad man is not a farmer, but he knows how to handle farm animals because that is one of his jobs. That skill is demonstrated in many ways. We see it best of all in the yards and terminals where all rail transportation ends and begins. It was here, behind the scenes of railroading, that the all-time record of American railroad transportation during the past war had its beginnings. In this setting, we find unsung experts at work on thousands of tasks, all of which put together mean efficient rail service for the nation. But we see railroad skill in other ways, too such as the new passenger and freight equipment, which the Progressive Railroad is quick to offer the public. An example is one of the famous 400 streamliners flashing across the country while its passengers ride in comfort and luxury inside. Railroad skill has resulted in such modern locomotives as this mighty rolling steam power plant, which in itself is a stirring tribute to the genius that has gone into the development of the nation's rail transportation. That skill is also apparent in the fast freights powered by 5,400 horsepower diesel electric locomotives, which transport thousands of tons over great distances in short periods of time. Yes, it is the skill of the men who manage and operate our great fleets of freight trains, which bring us our food, clothing, and luxuries that helps to make our way of life second to none.